What is going on, everybody? Once again, y'all know what time it is. Y'all know who I am. I am Mr. Soul of a Man 504, a.k.a. Damon Alvarez. And welcome once again, ladies and gentlemen, to Soulful Conversations, where we have the most amazing people on the planet Earth. And, and mm. once again, I have I have I have delivered once again. I scoured the planet, and this man was uh, graceful enough to uh, to bring his amazing presence. Um, so today we have Mr. Uh, Jeffrey Anderson Gunter. He is an actor, director, teacher. He's an artist. He's a father. Um, he's uh, he he's a living legend. It's not every day. You know, I've, I've had some amazing people on here, ladies and gentlemen, but this is the first time I can ever say that we've had like a, a living legend uh, on the show. And, you know, he still got a lot of he still got a lot of uh, miles to go on the road and a lot of gas left to go in the tank. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, without further ado, I just want to bring to you the amazing Mr. Jeffrey Anderson Gunter. Hello. Hello, everyone. How are you all? You know, good to see you. Thanks for having me on, man. You know, and I, I, you know, that living legend part, it's like, I got to go back and find out what, what's up with that. <laughs> <laughs> How did I get to that? You know, what did I do? <laughs> that is, you know, that's so weird for me. It's so weird for me, you know, because being, you know, living and being in this business, it's like I do you know, for my art and for my, my my passion and I'm enjoying it and so forth. So whatever is coming after it that people see, I don't know about. I literally don't know about, you know, <laughs> until somebody like you comes comes along and puts a label on it or a title. I'm like, what? What? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So yeah. Good to, you yeah. Know, good to hear. yeah. Thank you. And again, you know, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for being here. And, you know, one, one thing I, you know, I, I believe is, you know, giving people their flowers while they're still here. You know, we've had, like, we, yeah, we've had a lot of, we've had a lot of legend, you know, we've had a lot of just amazing people, um, you know, leave us, you know, just, uh, just recently. And, you know, I just want to say again, you know, thank you. Um, you know, thank you so much for, uh, you know, for, for being here uh, with us. So, so let's start uh, a little bit uh, from the beginning. So you were, uh, so you were, you were, well, before, you go, before you go on, we lost Olympia Dukakis today. Oh, and really? Yeah. We lost Olympia Dukakis and I'm she, a wonderful actress and condolences to her family and friends. And I'm going to miss her because, you know, she's one of a kind and a wonderful actress. So funny. You know, so I'm sorry to cut you off, but I. Just oh, that's okay. Know. Yeah, that that's okay. Yeah, well, she well, she's an ancestor now. So yeah, 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 yeah. So she yeah. now, so she's an ancestor. So um, so you were uh, so you were you were born uh, so you you were born in Jamaica, and yeah. you came uh, then you you came. So when you initially moved uh, uh, from uh, because I, I remember seeing that uh you were like you went to the movie theater with your mom and yeah, you I saw know. yeah you you saw a uh you saw a certain movie yeah and you know that the lady that you i believe i'm getting this right the la <laughs> the actress that you saw uh on the screen you were like hey mom i want to do that you were like your mom was very uh you know like unlike your dad a little bit you know we know how dads can be you know like you know you're gonna go to college you're gonna get this education you're going to become a, a this, this, or that. Those are right. your options, you know? <laughs> right, right, right. Especially a West Indian dad. Yes. You yes. know, I mean, black dad is another one thing, but a West Indian black dad? <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that movie, that movie was uh, One Potato, Two Potato. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, with Vinette Carroll and Robert Earl Jones, which is James Earl Jones's father. And um, this was in 1964. So I mean, we talking about way back then, and that's when I saw that film. Okay, and was it? And that and that was the point where you were like, uh, "Man, you know what, Mom? I want to do that." And yes. you know, she, yeah, I was mesmerized. I was mesmerized, <laughs> and and it it um it um provided a, a 
a connection, a confirmation for me. Because, you know, I, I mean, my dad was sending me to see all the, the, the cowboy films, you know, and I sort of had an inkling, you know, but not necessarily to do cowboy films, you know, but I knew I wanted to be on the screen. I wanted to be an actor. I, I like to pretend to be characters and stuff. And I, I mean, I did that, you know, for my sister and friends all the time, you know, never for my, my father, uh, because, you know, he cried that down. You know, my mom was fine. But, you know, dad was like, nah, that's sissy stuff. Nah, don't even bother. <laughs> you know? so that, was, yeah, that was the film. And uh, that was the time. And Vinette Carroll was the woman I saw. And what, what OK, so get it in and sticking with that story. Was was that the same person like when you move uh, to New York? That gave you the. Uh, All right, the don't give it away. Don't give it away. Don't give it away. Let okay. Me tell you. <laughs> okay. 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 So, okay. Um, all right. So, <laughs> I saw that in '64, right? And uh, time passed and so forth. And my mom uh, left to come to the United States. Mm -hmm. And basically, like a lot of families, she came here to work so that she could get the uh, permanent resident uh, status and send for us. You know, and then I came up and um, first thing I did was starting started to look for things pertaining to the business. You know, uh, 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 where can I go? I ended up at the Apollo Theater and saw things there. This was in uh, 68. And um, at that time, uh, a friend of mine uh, who I met through my mom said that there was a workshop down um, in Manhattan. I lived in Mount Vernon, so mm -hmm. I had to take the train down. Uh, there was a workshop down in Manhattan and, you know, come on down and so forth. So I went down, started the workshop. It was Clay Stevenson's Players Workshop. Uh, people like Howard Rollins, Wesley Snipes, Eric LaSalle, those are the kind of people that were in that workshop, right? So okay. this guy came to me and he said, um, you know, uh, uh, there's this lady that's looking for a triple threat, you know, somebody who could sing, dance, and act. So I, I did all of that. And back then, you had to do that. You had to excel in all three, singing, dancing, and acting, because that's how you got your work. So I went down, and uh, this lady gave me a grass skirt. And I said, well, what am I doing with this? She said, well, when you go in, you'll see, right? So I was about the third person. It was about 16 of us. I was about the third person in, went in, did my audition, and she asked me to do some other things. I put on the grass skirt, danced, and all that stuff. And it was about two and a half hours later. This the lady came and she said, uh, okay, guys, see you tomorrow. I said, Well, see you tomorrow. Is tomorrow the callback? She said, No, no, honey, you've been working, you've been hired, you know, you've been rehearsing. I'm like, what? You know, I didn't know from from auditioning and started anyhow. So I started rehearsing and did that show. It was called Play Mas by Mustafa Matura. And then um, right after that, we did some other shows. And in the, the, the last show where I found this out was uh, Alice, was Alice in Wonderland, Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland. And I was a Cheshire Cat, Mock Turtle, White Rabbit. And... Um, you know, it was a it was a pre Broadway run, right? It was off Broadway, mm -hmm. and it was about to go on Broadway. So the Post, the New York Post, did an article on me, and then in the article, it, it, it you know it was nice, and then on the side, it, it there was another article saying that Cheshire Cat and director feuding. So I went to her and I said, "Do you know we're feuding?" You know, and she laughed and she said, it's when they don't talk about you that you have to start worrying. Reading some more down in the post, I saw one potato, two potato. I said, wait a minute. And I went back to her. I said, did you do one potato, two potato? She said, yes, darling, you know, blah, blah, blah. This was the same woman that I saw in 64. That, that 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 confirmed for me that I needed to be, I wanted to be an actor. And her name was Vinette Carroll. She is the first African-American female director on Broadway. And she's responsible for where I am today. She's transitioned now. She's with the ancestors, but 
I stand wholly on her shoulders. I, you know, I, I, I love that story. And I love the fact that sometimes you never know, um, you know, uh, how it's going to happen or where it's going to happen. But just right. being, being, you know, be, being obedient to the process and being, you know, yet right. Being at the, you know, just being at the, the right place at the right time. And, you know, it's, it's just interesting, you know, how, uh, how all of that, you know, it's just amazing how, how all of that came together. So exactly. how, how, well, let me give you a little bit, a bit more trivia though. Mm -hmm. We're in rehearsal for something down there, you know, at the, it was called the urban arts core. So we're in rehearsal for something and Vinette stopped the rehearsal. She said she had to audition somebody, you know, and we're like, Oh, you know, we were really into this and so forth. So we stopped and this girl came in to audition and, you know, she said, what are you going to sing? Blah, blah. And she said, uh, uh, Vinette said, well, you know, give George your uh, um, music and go ahead. And we're, we're there. We're like folding our arms like, gosh, it's going to take forever. Blah, blah, blah. And this girl opened her mouth to sing. And some, I mean, she was singing Going Up Yonder. And trust me, we all went up yonder by the time. <laughs> okay. But you know who that girl was? <laughs> Jennifer Holiday. What? Jennifer Holiday. And it was right after that that she went into um, um, Your Arms Too Short to Box with God. That was her first Broadway show. And she knew nothing. She was so meek and so humble and so, and she was just so within herself. This was what, what she was all the time until she opened her mouth. And then she went like this. And as soon as she finished singing, she went right back to this. You know, but that's how <laughs> she was. But you know, you know, the divine order. That's mm -hmm. divine order right there. You know, who knew? I know. Like I said, that's see, that's why I use that word legend, because not just to put that on you, but the the people, you know, the the people uh that you uh, that that you came uh in, in contact with. Did you uh did, did you also work with uh Bernadette uh Steddens, I believe? Stannis. Stannis, yeah. Oh, from, Stannis. Uh, well, Bernadette, I met later on after the show, and we we got together on the um, at the um, uh, uh, the the Black Theater Festival in Winston Salem, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know we've been friends uh, ever since that. Yeah, Bernadette's a great people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like every year we have the uh, well, the last two years we haven't had it because of COVID, but. Every year we have the you know the, the Athens Fest in New Orleans, and uh, she's always. Oh, where are you? Been, where, huh? are you? where are you? I'm in, What's I'm in, yeah, I'm in I'm in Houston, but I'm from New Orleans. Oh, okay, got you, got you. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so every year, you know, long story short, she's always there. You know, one in one. I forgot. I forget the gentleman's name. Her co-star. He played Michael on uh, on Good Times as well. He he's yeah, there with. Like, um, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, 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 oh gosh, what's his name? Oh, he's gonna kill. I hope he ain't watching. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I forgot. I forgot his name too, cause his yeah. But well, you know, I just just to say that she's there like every year. Like yes. work. She's always there every year. But she's uh, you know, she's a she's a professional. She's you know, I mean, everybody was in love with with you know with uh, Thelma from Good Times. You know, exactly, exactly, so. exactly. exactly. <laughs> so yeah. you. So you you know you as uh you know you you as an actor you know like you say that you were a triple threat was there the one part of the art form that you loved over the other or was it like more all encompassing you know like the singing the dancing the, the acting Broadway or it was it was all encompassing but the the actor's side of it has the longevity mm. um, because well the actor and the singing side of it but even with the singing. You know, your voice goes after a certain age, except Melba Moore. Melba Moore is singing up a storm at the age she's at right now. So that <laughs> doesn't, I mean, that, that don't apply. Melba is just special in that way. But, um, um, you know, for, for dancing, at, when you turn 30, whatever, whatever, you know, your body starts to change and so forth. So you go somewhere else. But for the acting, you can do it for as long as you want to. And, you know, as long as you have breath in your body, and you can speak, you, you know, you just apply yourself to whatever role, role is given you. But at that time, we had to be that 
because mm -hmm. um, everybody, um, you know, wanted to work. So if you didn't get in as an actor, you could get in as a dancer. And if you didn't get in as a dancer, you could get in uh, in the chorus singing and so forth. But it was about the work. It was about getting work. And, you know, just about like, you know, how we like how we came across each other. Like I saw you on Clubhouse and right. I saw you. I was on the stage and I saw you. I said, wait, I said, that looks like the guy from the Steven Seagal movie. And I was like, I wonder if that's him, you know, and, and you know, and, and, and here we are. So that that just tells you. Uh, you know, that just tells you like what a what a long and and you know what a long and amazing uh career uh you know that you had. What what do you you know really attest that to your uh you know your your longevity in the business? Um I believed first believe first and foremost to do the work, um, and I mean excel in the work, meaning I needed to learn as much as I can, mm -hmm. and I'm still learning. I'm going to learn till I go six feet under, you know? But mm -hmm. learn as much as you can so when you're called, you're prepared every time, you know? If they ask you to do whatever, there you go. You're on it, you know, because you are prepared. This, this is, I make a living from this. I haven't worked nine to five in over 50 years. That's, that, that's making it to me, you know? Right. So it's like, you know, billions I ain't got, you know, but I'm making a living from what my passion is. So I've made it, you know, and that's all that anyone should be asking. If you come into this business because of the money or as a hobby uh, or, or, or just for the stardom, cut it out. Just cut it out because th there will be no longevity, you know, because you're in it for all the wrong reasons. I am supporting my passion and I'll do it as long as the divine allows me to and I'll go six feet under doing it. There was an actor, um, um, Adolf Caesar. Adolf, uh, he worked a, a, a lot on Broadway. He worked a lot on stage and he started working in his latter years uh, on film. Um, oh, the, a soldier's story you'll remember him from. He was the sergeant. You know, Ooh, you know, yes, he was that's, real good. Yeah, yes. that's Adolf Caesar. Okay, Adolf mm. just loved to work, and he always said, "Man, I don't care about start or whatever. Just give me work." And he died working. He died working, and I couldn't feel sorry. But you know, I'm, I miss him, of course. You know, mm -hmm. but I couldn't feel sorry because. He accomplished what he set out to do, and and I, I I applauded him. It's like, yeah, bro, you did it. You know, you got your stuff on, and you did it. You know, so you know, R.I.P. Adolf Caesar. Yeah, they they I think they would call that like going out on your shield. Hello. Yeah, they you call. Yeah, they, that is that is a warrior. <laughs> yes. And we, yeah, yes. we and we yeah, we, and we have fewer of those. I think we have fewer, fewer and fewer of those, you know, nowadays than what we had, uh, you know, more in in yesteryear. And yeah, you know, as, as far as the business goes, how um, well? What are the major differences that you see now, like in the, you know, with with like Netflix and the streaming services? Do you see like more opportunity now? Uh, than, than what you did, like maybe when, when you started, like way back when? Of course, definitely. I mean, there, there are more opportunities across the board. Um, when it comes to what you termed your survival job, you know, mm -hmm. back, back in my day, you either, you either um, did bartending or you stripped for a survival job or you were a waiter, you know, and now you have uh, Uber Eats and Uber and Live. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like, it's a game and you can actually make a living from your survival job mm -hmm. very well, you know? What I think, so that's good in that respect, your, your, when it comes to your survival job. But as far as um, people, going for their passion and doing the work to stay in the business mm -hmm. that's lacking that's lacking they're 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 looking at 
the destination. You know, they want to get there so fast. Yeah. And they don't want to do the work, the journey to get there. You know, uh, so many me so much mediocrity is happening right now because people don't want to take the time to invest in their craft. If you don't do something every day toward your craft, your instrument, you have wasted a day. You cannot live in your head, be a, be, 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 be a legend in your mind and, and just coast along and maybe you'll get a break, you know, but trust me, it won't last. You know, that break, if you don't utilize what that break means, you know, that's why, you know, um, Tyler Perry, when he started out, you know, first of all, uh, Tyler mirrored what Robert Townsend did. Robert Townsend was the first um, uh, self-sufficient survivor to me in this business. Mm -hmm. Tyler did the same thing. He mirrored what Robert Townsend did, and he's gone even further. But what I like about Tyler, Tyler started and Tyler was getting a lot of you know, naysayers and, you know, he don't do this and he done, he don't know this and so And Tyler didn't take that stuff and go well to heck with them and so forth and so on. I'm sure some he did, you know, but what I noticed that he did, he took that information and he like researched to see what folks were talking about. Mm -hmm. And the stuff that he said, yeah, they're right. He fixed, he fixed it in writing, he fixed it in directing and producing it, he fixed it all. And then he surrounded himself with people who knew the work, who were professionals, and he learned from them. That's the role that Tyler took to be where Tyler is now. He didn't just arrive, you know, he took uh, the tidbits and put it all together to become who he is right now. And I'm so proud of what he is and who he is right now because he didn't just say, you know, to heck with him, you know, and, and his ego was so big, you know, he, no. He took the information and said, okay, I can use this. They're right on this, so for, let me go learn this. You know, Mary J. Blige, when she first started out, you know, she was not vocally all there, but she got in and she said, let me go and get vocally correct. And she went and studied. And Mary J. Blige is like off the chain, right? So it's it, you got to get that ego out of the way, you know, so that you can get to where you need to be, you know, because God has given you whatever gifts you have. But if you take it and, tr try, to, and try to control it, you know, once, look at it. Shh. That's my big dog. If okay. you to, to control it, then it, it's, it's a problem. One, one second. Okay. Jay. Okay, come, come, Pooch. Uh, hush. All right. So, um, so, come on, hush. Someone is at the door. Huh? Someone was. I'm sorry, man. I know we're good. Yeah. So, um, um, you know, all that to say, you 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 got to you got to take your your, your you got to take your information and utilize it the best way you know how to mm -hmm. make you know to, to 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 get to where you need to go, especially if it's your passion that you're following. Yeah, because nowadays I feel like you know it's such a microcosm or microwave society that we live in and Ooh, you know, yeah. yeah every everybody wants it now but you know just to kind of sum up what you're saying it's like the the uh the purpose is in the process and if exactly. you don't right and if you don't and if you don't sprinkle passion on that then you know it's it's honestly all for nothing yeah and th and then it's fake you know i mean i'm living in the land of fake but i mean i can go out there and play that fake game if i want to but i know you know, I got to come back to reality, sincerity, and myself. And if you want that, you know, truth, reality, sincerity, then come and speak to me. Otherwise, stay out there with the fake people. You know, I mean, play that game. I I'm not. I'm not a part of that. I'm not into that. You know. Right. Um, and so let me ask you this. Um, so how, how important is it to maintain 
relationships along the way or cultivating relationships um you know in in the business as it maybe maybe it pertains to like longevity in a sense. It, it does but i will uh, say that good relationships mm, okay are essential in this business good relationships especially relationships that comes from uh you doing your work and people respecting your work mm -hmm. and uh, for instance um, um um jim burrows big director you know he's white he's 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 directed most of the hits that are around and so forth and i was on a, a series where he directed the pilot and you cannot cry down because of your opinion what someone else who has a vision for something wants you know mm -hmm. just do what they say first right do what they say if it doesn't work they'll change it you know but if you go in there with this attitude well i wouldn't do this that I, no you know they're in the position that they're in to do the work and get it done right just abide by what they're saying for right now i mean within reason because if they you know, they tell you to strip down and so forth different story right but you know abide by what they're asked to do and if it's if it's not, if it's not working then change it right same thing with steven seagal you know he knows what he wants so forth and so on and you go ahead and you do that they'll come to you and they say well jeff what do you think about this and then you give your opinion you know but you're talking there about about work ethic mm. which means being on time, listening, taking directions, and shutting up until you're asked, and then you give whatever. That encompasses work ethic. Something will come up, and there's a role that I might be suited for. They're not going to say, uh, call Jeff and ask him to come in an audition or have the audition. They'll say, call Jeff Anderson Gunter. You know, this is his his work. This is his role. You know, that kind of relationship is essential. And your work is what uh, uh, speaks for itself when you're in that position to to dictate, to, to show mm -hmm. what you're about. You know, um, class, respect, no ego, and, and being on time. I cannot stress that. Being on time, My, Michael Collier has a, 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 a saying: if if you're there on time, you're late. If you're early, you're on time. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like it makes sense because you know I I I would go to the set. Uh, the call is at ten o'clock. I'm there at quarter of ten. And I'm sitting down and waiting. Everybody else is coming uh, uh, fifteen minutes after, right? And the call was for 10 o'clock, which means that you don't get there at 10. You get there and be ready to work at 10, which means you had to be there earlier, right? Mm -hmm. And then 10 o'clock, you're ready to work. That's being on time. You know, I was so sick of people using me as, as an example. People hated me because I said, look at you. <laughs> you, know, here this, you know, and they would hate me. You know, it's like, you, do you think you're special? I said, no. You know, I, I, I worked with a woman who insisted on, 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 on being prompt for your calls, you know, because it's, it's, a, bad, it's a bad rep that, that us as black folks have, especially mm -hmm. Jamaicans, please forget it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I heard uh, Terry Crews talk about professionalism when he was on, uh, I think it was one of the Expendables movie. And he, uh -huh. you know, he was like, I looked at the script, man, I was so mad. My only had like my, my only had like uh like so, a certain amount of lines and I was just sitting around and you know, and he said that, you know, one day he just, you know, woke up, had to look himself in the mirror and say, like, you know, it is it's you know, this is an opportunity, you know, I'm gonna set, you know, such and such, I'm living my dream, but you know, I have to come here. And he said, I, I, I changed my, my, he said, I have to change my perception. I have to change my attitude. He yeah. said, once I did that, 
he said then they were like, hey, man, you know, we have, we have all of these opportunities start to open up for you. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. It's your, your whole attitude has to dictate your longevity. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think uh, I can attribute my longevity to. And the other aspect of that is looking at the amount of lines you have and so forth. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's human to do that. But how about doing with what you have so that it stands out? I have, I went to an audition, I had three lines, three lines, and this was for a series. And I was, they were looking for an aloof Rastafarian, right? Mm -hmm. So I went in and I did my three lines <laughs> and they, <laughs> they, they <laughs> called me back. And then I did my three lines again, right? And I got the job, okay? I'll tell you who it was with. And time come for shooting the pilot for this, this, this series. And I did my three lines. We had to wait for the crew and them to stop laughing so that we could get back to it. Then they started counting every take that I did and did my three lines if I'm getting the same reaction. Right. By the time they did, they tested on the pilot for this series and me and my three lines, they, they had a, 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 a test for the audience. Mm -hmm. the, the lead was at number one and I was number two with my three lines. <laughs> and what that meant that they can't let me go. They now have to bring me into the series because um, I'm valuable. I mean, mm -hmm. money. I mean, audience wants to see me, right? This was with Tony Danza, and uh, uh, this was Hudson Street. Oh yeah, I remember that Hudson Street. Yeah, back in the day, and they had to bring me back, and they had to write that um, I was actually playing an undercover detective as the, the waiter with my three lines and this and this. So they worked me in and I, I did the series, you know, I did the mm -hmm. series. So, you know, you cannot, you cannot, um, you, you have to value whatever you have and work with what you have to the best of your ability, you know, because after you do that and you give your hundred percent, it's out of your hands. It's out of your hands, you know, but all you have to be concerned about is that I gave 100%. There's nothing more I could have done. And you're, you're, you're good to go. Whether or not you get the role, besides the point. Did you do your work? Yes, you did. So what, was there ever a point where uh, something was offered to you and you turned it down and you look back and you, and you just kind of like, God, man, I really wish I would have, you know, I really wish I ain't like something that just turned like, big or you know just legendary in a sense uh, um yes and no yes because it was a campaign this was in new york mm -hmm. and it was a campaign for uh coca-cola and you know i got the job and they made me an offer and i turned it down and this you know everybody was like why did it and this is it i don't drink coke <laughs> i don't I don't, I'm, I mean, every time I saw that, I'd be lying. You know what I mean? And I mean, yeah, it was oodles of dollars and so forth, but I couldn't bring myself because there are kids watching this mm -hmm. and I'm there sipping and talking about mm, how good it is. And so, and I don't drink it. I think it's bad. For, well, I'm not even going to say that, you know, because, you know, it, they, everything has its place. You know what I mean? But personally, I don't do soft drinks. I don't do carbonated beverages. I don't smoke cigarettes. Why am I gonna go and 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 in front of a camera and do that? You know, and lie. You know, I I it's it's against my nature. I'm sorry, you know. So that that was one of the things, but I didn't really regret it. But it's like when you <laughs> when you think about the money, <laughs> like, God, I could have had this and I could have that's reality, you know, but I, I was able to live with myself after. Mm -hmm. That's more important to me. 
so going back, um, I remember I saw you. Uh, I remember I saw you in the the Michael Jackson video. Uh, was it uh, the the black and white video? Yeah. So so kind of take me back uh, to to that. Or take us back uh, when you know when you maybe like the audition when you know that that process. Well, firstly, um, I had worked with Michael uh, previously in The Wiz um, okay. because the 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 director. Um, Sid, uh, not Sidney Fury. Um, um, I forgot his name right now. But he, uh, I was doing the next film that he was going to direct. The next film was called um, Just Tell Me What What You Want with mm -hmm. Alan McGraw and Alan King. That was my first film. Just Tell Me What You Want. And uh, um, uh, so he said, you know, just come and do this, you know. And, and so I was in all the the scenes with the models and you know the 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 munchkins is that you would never know i was there because it was either in full makeup or the the, the camera was so far all you see was people walking in the the green the red and the gold you know, in, 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 in in um 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 at um the world trade center so um that's you know that's when uh, um i first met mike and we would have great conversations, great spiritual conversations, you know, when we weren't working, you know, and it was always wonderful and fun. So years later now, well, no, I, I also did, um, um, I think it was not Billy Jean. I did another video where he was in the, um, uh, he was in the, the, train system in new york i forgot which one that was i i was over a fire or something you know a, a drum that was lit i was playing a homeless person and that's the second time that i saw him but then when this came up my agent said um there's an audition for this video you know just go down you know it, it only pays this and um just see what happens right they still didn't tell anyone who the video was for right mm. so my thing is don't refuse to do anything as long as it's legal go down do it get your face out there whatever you never know right so i'll go down it was off santa monica boulevard in la and um uh, thousands i'm not thousands hundreds of people right so wrote my name in so forth and then they paired me up. It was myself and four Asian ladies, right? And we were supposed to go in and all we do is the head uh, thing, right? And okay, so um, I talked to the ladies and stuff and this is what we're going to do. And, you know, just let's just go and have fun. So we went in there and we did our little bit with the head and all that. <laughs> and it was fine. So I, I didn't think anything more about it right so i left went home then i got a call that they want to see me again you know i said for what <laughs> you know they have the tape <laughs> you know? they say yeah but the director is going to be there so all right so i went back down and by then it was only about 15 of us that they were called that they called mm -hmm. back and so we did the same head thing and so forth and then they asked us questions and all that the thing now is when I met Michael during the Wiz, I didn't have dreads. By this time, I did, right? So um, about the following week, I heard that I got the job, right? And I'm like, okay, cool. You know, it was paying up some pittance. And so we went in and then I heard whose uh, um, um, video it was going to be, you know? And I was like... Lord, I was like, what? You know, and <laughs> then Michael, you know, he, my Michael and, and the director, they both chose this face, you know, and then on the last day of shooting, Michael came in and I said, well, what's up, Michael? You know, he said, hey, so forth and so on. I said, you don't remember me, do you? And then I reminded him, oh, it was over. <laughs> it was over, you know, because he didn't know that he knew me when he chose me for the video, mm -hmm. you know, and all of a sudden here we were, you know, and it's like old home week and so forth. And uh, from that time we kept it, we kept in touch, you know, it, it was wonderful. 
wonderful individual. Miss him dearly. Miss him dearly. We love, I wish he was still around today. Oh my God. We, you know, those, those versus battles that you see on Instagram. You know, oh like, man. People have been talking about like a Michael Jackson versus Prince versus for like, like months now. Oh my dad would, I mean, I, you know, I, I love the one with us, uh, Pat LaBelle and- uh, Yes. Yeah. That, that, yeah, that yeah. was amazing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So let, so let me ask you this, what, what like, uh, so going back, uh, being on the, the set of The Wiz, uh, I know you, could, you, I, I, that had, cause people still to this day, that's like one of those movies that just stands the test of time. Uh -huh. with so many great, uh, singers and, and actors and actresses on there. So what, just what was it like just being on that set every day? Well, no, well, it, it wasn't every day. It, it okay. uh, yeah, it was a few days, but the times that I was there it was a lot of people. It's like uh, when they did the, 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 the different colors during the, um, the, the, um, uh, trade the the, the the you know the towers the yeah, yeah 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 when they did those it was like every model that was in new york the adjoining states internationally you know <laughs> it was like just pretty people just pretty black people running all over the place and then on the day the munchkin days it was all dancers and singers and stuff you know sitting on these things going around like they were little people mm -hmm. and stuff so, so um, those were fun. It was fun time, you know? And the craft service was the best time because that's when you would meet everybody. That's when I would have a chance to, 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 to chat with Mike because he came out, he, yeah, he had his, his trailer and all of that. Yeah. But he came out, he, he mingled, you know? He talked mm -hmm. to folks and, and, you know, and, and the, the, uh, PAs would be like, no, don't do that. And he'd be like, nah. you know, come on, you know, we'll let, we're people, you know, they're not right. bothering me and all of that. So, so he, he was that, he was that open. Man, that's, you know, it's, it's beautiful. You know, it's, it's beautiful to hear those stories about him. Cause you, you know, how the media paints him and all that good stuff, but you know, just amazing to, to hear those stories of how, how personable he was. Cause you know, just regular people seeing him, you know, we you know we think he's like you know uh, larger than life. Um, you know, in in a sense, uh, uh, Mike Michael was a practical joker. He was <laughs> to get a laugh, anything to get a laugh. You know, he was a practical, and I I love that. I love that. So you said that uh, you that you never had a childhood, and that you can't kill the little boy inside of you. Um, can you can you explain the meaning of that? Um, all right, the, the first part of that, the, the, the childhood. Okay, mm -hmm. um, my mom and dad had split up, so okay. um, I started living with his sister, my dad's sister, and she was in the police force, right? And she actually came to live with us in my mom's place um you know for a few years and it wasn't very nice um myself and my blood sister we didn't have the best time there and some things happened that i can't even go into because it'll take forever but some things happened where she had to leave because i wasn't having it and i was young mm -hmm. right but i wasn't having it you know and i know that um my mom was sending funds down to take care of us and stuff. And we wouldn't see, we, we weren't eating properly, you know? So all of that stuff was in my brain and I knew that something had to happen. It had to stop. So anyhow, um, um, I had it out with her and my dad one day and they said, well, you know, whatever, Go, you know, you're on your own, take care of yourself. So at, uh, in my teens, I had to uh, take, collect rent from some people who were renting in my mom's place. I had to send my sisters to school. Um, I even had to uh, uh, um, take care of the yard and all that before I went to school. So that whole period was 
like grow up real fast, Jeffrey. You got stuff you have to do. (laughs) (laughs) The only I had one um um one toy, and it was a tricycle that I, I, I had. That's all I ever had was a tricycle. And I loved that tricycle until it was taken away from me because I was told I was too big for it, you know? Fine. Mm-hmm. But nothing replaced it and so forth. So in that sense, I really didn't have a regular childhood um, of, of, you know, I had responsibilities before I had anything else, you know? So I had to take care of that. Um, and because of that, innately i'm a fun loving silly individual i love to laugh i love to make jokes i love to see people i will go out and dress stupidly just to elicit laughs from other people just to get the satisfaction of seeing them laugh i will get my friends and say come on let's put this on and this on that and see how many people you know, gonna laugh at us and so forth. And we would, and we, you know, we get the laughs and so forth. But the pleasure would be like, we made some folks laugh. I'd go into a store and, you know, the the the, 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 the attender would be like, and I go, watch, watch, watch me make her laugh, you know? And I go and do, do something stupid just so that this person could laugh, you know? And mm-hmm. I think that's so valid. You know, because people don't know how to laugh anymore. They don't know how to be light anymore. They kill the little girl and the little boy inside them. That's just silly, you know? So that's what I mean when I say I never killed a little boy because that little boy is silly. He don't care. He can come out and do stupid stuff and (laughs) just be be a mess, you know? And it's all right. It's okay because that's a part of living. You know, and I love that aspect of anybody. You know, if me and you get together and your little boy come out and my little boy come out, it's over. (laughs) (laughs) It's it's a total mess that's going to happen. So you, so um, when you, so when you, you left New York and you went, you moved to California, you said that there was a, there was a voice that spoke to you and said like, you know, (laughs) you moved to LA and you, you lay back down. Yeah. Like, like, move that. Could you could you tell us a little bit about that story? <laughs> All right. Um, now you know I've I've told the story several times, and a, a lot of folks think that I'm daft. I'm going out of my head, but you know if I'm nothing else, I'm truthful. And this really happened. I was living in the Bronx. I had the Broadway show Reggae going on, and and this was about uh, 79, 80, 81, something like that, and. Um, um, I was working at the on the NBC account at AT and T. At that time, all the signals for television used to come through the phone lines. So mm-hmm. that's that's you know that's why they had the NBC had an account at AT and T. So I was there, and so I was working during the day, and I had my Broadway show at night. So weekend came, and it was Sunday, and. Uh, I had a matinee that day and just before um, maybe 10 o'clock, the sun came, it was, was winter. So the sun came through the blinds and it started burning my face and I woke up, you know, but before I opened my eyes, I just heard you need to go to California. And I looked around, you know, it's like, and my cat Celeste was at the, the, the foot of the bed, you know? So Celeste jumped up and looked at me like, what's your problem? What's up? <laughs> so I said, I, I said to myself, okay, that I must have just been coming out of a dream or something, you know, let me leave it alone. All right. So I put my head back down. I closed the blinds and I started going to REM again. And then I heard it again. Then I really jumped up and I looked in the bathroom and I opened the door, went to my roommate's room. Did you just come over and say something in my room? So he said, no, you know? And I'm like, what the Dickens is going on? I'm losing it, right? And I came in and I sat on the bed and I looked at Celeste and I said, Celeste, we going to California. <laughs> and that week I gave notice to, to um, AT&T and I gave notice to um, um, the show 
and started packing and uh, the rest is history. The best thing I ever did. Knew nobody in California, nobody. Got to the, the airport, um, put my stuff in a, 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 a locker, went out, got a paper, did like this, closed my eyes and that's how I found my apartment. You know, it's a, a 6446 Lexington Avenue and I called and the guy said, yeah, it's, it's, it's ready. And he spoke Spanish, so I spoke to him in Spanish. Showed up there and he looked at me like, are you the person I spoke to? <laughs> yeah, you know? So, and that was my first apartment on Lexington Avenue in Hollywood, you know, and uh, it was a pea green carpet with terrible furniture and it smelled bad. But I put Celeste down in the middle of the floor and I said, Celeste, we home. <laughs> and and that, that was it. <laughs> see that that's a great story when steve harvey says you know you have to step out on faith and when he when he talks about jumping that's yeah. what he's talking about you know exactly. when yeah when and i sometimes i tell people that follow me sometimes life just has no roadmap you know like exactly i can you know i can look at i can look at what you've done or you know all of the people that you've named but you know it's 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 always going to turn out just a little bit differently you know for of course us. Yeah, of for course. each individual. Of course, of course, you know, and 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 it, I think it depends on uh, your life experience and mm -hmm. um, your spiritual beliefs. And I mean, I, I still don't know what manifested a voice that I heard. You know what I mean? I, but I don't question it. It's like right. whatever. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I listen and I'm here. You know, leave me alone. <laughs> you know. <laughs> like if, if like if that voice would have said, okay, look, you know, you you gonna put a book out and it's gonna be uh you know, it's gonna be a national bestseller. You go with the voice. Exactly. You, know, you exactly. go with the voice. Exactly. So exactly. what so was so what was moving to so what what was like one of the hardest decisions that you've ever had to make? Was it when you left Jamaica initially to move to uh to move to New York or was it the, the California? No, leaving uh, Jamaica was a, a big one because um, I was in high school then, but, you know, just about to graduate. That was a, a mess to me and um, my friends and yes. what I knew, you know, all the stuff. The only person I knew up here was my mom. I mean, mom is great, you know, but that other aspect outside of home and yeah. mom, um, all that would be left behind. I had to start new. And at that time, if you're not old enough to embrace change and, and, and renewal, you know, you know, you're lost, you're lost, you know? So um, that was the, 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 the uh, yeah, that was the most um, impactful decision that I had to make. And it wasn't, it was made for me. So I just, I just followed, you know, but, you know, it, it was necessary. It was necessary. Right. Like like you said, when you move, you know, when you made that jump to, uh, you know, to L.A., a lot of people that, you know, I hear nowadays, it's always the, you know, well, you know, how, you know, how is this going to happen? It, it's progression. It's life. It's your story. Yeah. It's, you know, it's 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 a part of, you know, like people, it's a part of your destiny. You know exactly. what I mean? And I think nowadays everybody everybody wants to have everything handwritten like a script in front of them, <laughs> so that they know every. And it's just it just I try to say, it just doesn't happen like that, you know. It, right. just, it, it doesn't. What you can do though, as an individual, mm -hmm. um, is is use your time on Earth, your days and your moments to learn. Learn as much as you can, because I knew when I made that decision from New York to come here and I knew nobody here, um, I knew that, that, that I was going to make it and, and, and it was not going to be a problem because I knew how to speak. I knew uh, um, how to type. I, you know, I had these skills. Right. I had honed uh, to assist me whenever. You know, because I don't ever want to just sit back and go, what am I going to do? No, all that I'm going to do, the tools have been given to me and I embrace them and, you know, sharpen them. So whatever comes up, there I am. 
you know, and you use your whole facility for this. So if you're going to make any kind of move, just make sure that you're inundated with all the tools that is going to be needed for anything because you don't know where you're going to be. You know, at some point during this journey, I had to live in my car for two two, two, two uh, months. Right. Mm -hmm. And I had two big dogs. This is not one of these. They're, they're gone now. But um, it was two Akitas. Right. Japanese mm -hmm. Akitas. And I had a Camaro. Now, <laughs> right? my luggage, two Akitas and a Camaro and me. Okay. But we had the best time, the best time because I, I, I knew what to do. And then I met people who would help and tell me what to do. I knew when the police was going to come around. I knew where to park and not to park because the other homeless folks would tell me and so forth. And they would take care of me. They would take care of me because they saw that I wasn't just about, you know, uh, uh, throwing my life away and so forth. Mm -hmm. I just got into a situation that, um, better is going to come because I'm going to apply myself, just have to get over this hump, you know? And that was the, that was the, 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 the point of view that I had so that I move forward. You know, it was never me, Kuba, me, Kuba, me, Kuba, oh, poor me, blah, blah, blah. No, you know, everything, because I, li I lifted up and came to California, right? It's right. my fault, if anything, right? So it's like, oh no, it's a situation. It's a growing, you know, it's a, it's a gathering of strength right now. All right, this is here. This is what's happening. What needs to be done? Okay, do it. And that's it. That's the formula, you know, find out what it is that's happening, address it and find out what the, the, the solution is and apply yourself and do it, you know? And as simple as that seems, it's so necessary in living and life and not existing in living you know big difference between the, the, the existing and living right and it's it's like uh what i'm about to say kind of goes into what you said it's like you know you had all of these tangibles that you that you've learned that you could add to your situation you know once you exactly. made that move it's like kanye west said everything i'm not makes me everything i am so exactly. right 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 so exactly. You know, and I'll tell you to add to that. Um, um, there was a there was a a time when the work wasn't coming as fast as mm -hmm. it, I, you know it, I needed it to to sustain myself, right? So I said, "Well, what do I need to do?" It's okay. Um, I was watching TV, and Marley Matlin came on in an interview, and Marley Matlin, of course, is uh, hearing impaired, and she was doing an interview. Right. And she was signing and I'm watching. I'm going, God, that's beautiful. You know, and the divine said, you need to learn that, you know. And I said, OK, and called up uh, the next day, called around and found out that um, Santa Monica College was offering a sign language class for free for six weeks. <laughs> All you had to do was go down there. And I said, OK, you bet I'm there, you know. But then I said and I said, well. I don't know no deaf people, you know? So I called three of my friends. Oba Babatunde was one, my friend Cisco, and Kiki Shepard. And we got together and we went down to Santa Monica College to learn sign language. <laughs> we, would be, we would be in the gym, right? And we're signing to each other because I said, no, we can't speak. We can't speak. You know, if we keeping this stuff, we got to sign to each other. And everybody in the gym thought that we were deaf. Everybody. <laughs> thought that we were deaf. So, you know, we learned, we finished all of that. At the end of that, the first person to get a job and it was signing and speaking was Oba Babatunde. I want to slap him. I said, I brought, I brought you in there and you, you here, you come and you get the job, right? But then uh, Deaf West was looking, this is the Deaf Theater Company. They mm -hmm. were looking for somebody to do of Mice and Men. And that was my next job. It was the challenge of my life. 
because you're using both sides of your brain at the same time. You're signing and you're speaking, right? I mm. finished the show and um, I don't hear nothing, right? Everybody's back and everybody's about to go out for, for um, 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 a curtain call. I hear nothing. I went, oh God, they hated the thing, you know? And I don't want to go out there. I can't go out there, you know? <laughs> so time come for me to go out and I'm like, okay, God, here we go. And I went out. And all I saw was the hands going like this, and then they started to pound on the floor <laughs> and stuff. And it didn't occur to me, it was my first experience. So it didn't occur to me that they don't applaud because right. they can't hear, right? So they do this. I just stood there and bawled crocodile tears. <laughs> <You know? laughs> because they liked what I did. And this was a deaf and hearing audience sitting and enjoying the same performance and understanding everything. And I had accomplished that just because I didn't want to sit around idle and I learned sign language. So you got to increase your skills every mm -hmm. time. Work on your craft 24 seven. You never know. Uh, so that that my uh, so one of my last question for you. Uh, so how how did you uh, initially meet uh, Kiki Shepherd? <laughs> Kiki and I started um, uh, with Vinette Carroll. I was with Vinette first, and mm -hmm. then he came in. Uh, I I think it was Alice uh, that she came in as a dancer, and we've been friends ever since. You know, and she does mm -hmm. some wonderful work on Sickle Cell with her Sickle Cell Golf Tournament that's coming up in November. I'll, I'll send you the, the information. But okay. um, she's doing some wonderful work. And uh, the, 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 the thing that I remember best with Kiki is we all planned when we were doing Alice in Philadelphia, right? There was a, 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 a production number at the end of the show. And you know, at the end of each show uh, or the end of a run of a show, it's all pranks. Everybody's pranking everybody, right? Mm -hmm. So everybody decided that, okay, as the dance number is happening and everybody goes down to the front of the stage, nobody would go down. We'd all stay in the back and Kiki was the only one. <laughs> <laughs> Kiki, time came and Kiki swung that dress and, so, and she looked beside her. Nobody was there. She said, okay, it's my turn. And she went for it. And she was kicked out. But, but I mean, that was the best time during that show uh, uh, with Keeks, you know, but we've been friends ever since. You know, myself, her, and Reginald Vell Johnson, we've been friends ever since the 70s. Yeah, because I saw, uh, yeah, I saw a video of y'all. It was like, a, I think it was for like a birthday party of yours. They were celebrating your birthday. Might have been, it was a few years back. It was you and it was you. It might have been like eight years ago, eight, nine years ago. I, I saw it on YouTube. Okay. And uh, yeah, it was I like, need to look, I need to look at this stuff. I don't know what they have on there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was, yeah, so it was you and, and Kiki Shepard and, and, uh, and, uh, and Reginald Fell Johnson. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. There's a whole group of us, man, that came through Vinette because Reggie came through Vinette as well. You yeah. know, he is responsible for a whole bunch of folks. Cicely Tyson, Sherman Emsley, a whole bunch of people. Yeah, I'm going to uh, I'm gonna have to do some research on that. Yeah, it's V-I-N-N-E-T-T-E -T -T -E and C-A-R-R-O-L-L. Vinette, Vinette okay. Carroll. Cool. All right. I'll, I'll, and, text you, I'll text you the name. Okay. All right. Cool. And thank you. And again, uh, you know, as we as we bring this to, to a close, you know, I just wanna uh, just wanna thank uh, the amazing Mr. Uh, Jeffrey uh, Anderson uh, Gunther for uh, for being here with us, for you know, giving us his time, his energy, uh, and his knowledge. And again, you know, I do believe in giving people, you know, their roses, you know, while he, you know, while he's still here. I know you have, you know, I know you still have a lot of work to do you know, on this side of it, you know? <laughs> yep. Got a series coming out. I'll tell you about that when I can. Oh, okay, okay, cool, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so in, in closing, would you, is, is there anything that you, any parting knowledge or wisdom that you'd like to, because you, you've already given so much, but is there like any, any like words of encouragement that you'd like to give, not just the younger people, because I, I don't necessarily feel like you know, you, you know, people say, oh, this is a young person. You know, I, I don't feel like that. I feel like, you know, as, as long as you have the willing and the passion and the drive, it's never too late for something. 
Well, I mean, you just said it. Um, everyone should question what is my passion? Mm. And what that means is what is it that makes me the happiest, makes me get up in the morning, makes me just have a song in my heart when I'm doing it? What is that thing? And if, if you can't, if you don't have an answer to that, and a lot of people don't, if you don't have an answer to that, try different things to try and find it, you know? And when you do, go after it and don't let anyone tell you, you cannot accomplish what you set out to do. Because if it's in you, if it's your passion, your soul's truth, you're gonna make it in what you choose, what, what, what your gift is to pursue. You will make it. Don't let anybody tell you differently as long as you're fulfilling your passion. But for God's sake, find out what it is. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Again, a, uh, another amazing, amazing, amazing uh, rendition of Soulful Conversations. And again, you guys know who I am, Mr. Demond Alvarez, a.k.a. Mr. Soul of a Man, 504, and the amazing Jeffrey Anderson Glunther. And as always, folks, we are out this piece. So, peace. Thank you.